conduct and so on. So you get the gist. But based on each individual's limited perspective, they were unable to make an accurate assessment of the whole creature as a whole, prohibiting them from having a holistic understanding of what it was that they were dealing with. And the relevance of this parable will become uh, more clear towards the end of the talk as it relates to the big question of why are our results so different um, from everyone else's? So human understanding of the deep sea has always been limited by our ability to sample it. And deep sea ecology has a long history of mischaracterization. So Eric Forbes, the grandfather of deep sea ecology, studied the deep sea back in the mid 1800s using a naturalist stretch. And his claim to fame was the discovery of the Azoic zone, which basically stated that as you get deeper in the water, the abundance of deep sea fauna diminishes to the point of non-existence or an Azoic zone. Mm -hmm. Uh, the issue <laughs> was that as he sampled deeper and deeper, his naturalist grab wasn't penetrating the sediment, so he assumed that there was no life there. So this was accepted as the gospel in deep sea ecology for almost 100 years until the Challenger expedition in the mid-1900s using a weighted anchor dredge showed that there was diversity in the deep sea. So from the early days of using Forbes's naturalist dredge, deep sea sediment sampling tools have evolved over time, increasing the accuracy of our assessments and providing more clarity about the way deep sea systems function. During Deepwater Horizon, the multi-core tool was the primary um, tool that was used to sample the sediments. And despite improvements in sediment sampling techniques over time, the limitation with this approach is that it's reductionist. It doesn't provide a full picture of what is on the seafloor. So it's long been shown that this kind of kill and count them approach can underestimate the functional importance of the benthos, in addition to, be limit to being limited in its uh, um, in its perspective of the seafloor. So our survey was conducted using a sediment profile imaging camera, which is shown here. And this system is a combination of a traditional downward facing camera, which is pictured here in the upper right, <coughs> which captures an area view of the seabed and a sediment profile imaging camera, which captures a profile there for 15 to 20 centimeters of the sediment column. So the spy camera is, um, contains a camera that's situated above a, above a prism. The prism's filled with distilled water and has a mirror at a 45 degree angle, which reflects the image from the faceplate up to the camera lens. And because the prism is filled with distilled water, there's always this optically clear path of view for image capture, regardless of ambient turbidity. So the way that the system works is that as the system's lowered to the seabed, a weighted trigger activates the plan view camera, capturing an aerial view of the sea floor. The system continues to descend until it contacts the bottom Upon contact, tension is released from that cable, allowing the inner carriage to lower and the weighted prism to penetrate the seafloor. When this occurs, an undisturbed profile image of the upper sediment column is captured, allowing us to document a number of physical, chemical, and biological processes right at and beneath the sediment surface. So the huge benefit of this technology from a scientific standpoint is the ability to document behavior and function without removing the animals from their natural habitat, being the sediment. And so the products of this system are an aerial surface image of the seafloor. And these images are relatively intuitive, so I'm not going to spend a lot of time on them. But I show this to highlight that we can deduce a number of small scale features on the sediment surface, such as tubes, burrows, and mounds. And we can also identify organisms, macroorganisms as they exist. So we can see that there's a nudibrank here in the upper portion of the image. And those images are paired with undisturbed profile images. So there's that nudibrank that we saw from the plan view image. And uh, to run through this very quickly and orient you, at the top of these profile images, we have the water column. And the amount of water column that's visible varies based on the penetration depth of that prism. Below the water column, we have the sediment surface. And below the sediment surface, we have the sediment oxic layer. And then there's this basically disambiguation, which is the, what was defined as the redox potential discontinuity. And that serves as a proxy for a uh, so, uh, a proxy for the amount of biological activity that's occurring within the sediment. And then beneath that, we have anaerobic sediment. So it's easy, I think, to conceptualize the importance of seafloor environments like a kelp forest or a coral reef, because we can easily visualize the complexity and diversity of the structures and organisms that exist there because they sit right there on the surface. When we compare those to like the soft bottom um, sediment, while there are some features on the seabed, as I highlighted before, the majority of the structural complexity that's important for understanding function and health exists beneath the opaque 
surface of the seafloor, which highlights the usefulness and power of sediment profile imaging. So again, we're capturing these relatively undisturbed cross sections and I'm, and I'm highlighting the applicability of this tool because it has real importance when we talk about uh, the story for the deep water horizon. So just bear with me a bit as I, as I walk us through this. So this uh, particular example is showing the ability of this tool to be able to capture really sensitive features that are occurring right uh, at the bottom of the seafloor. And this is important because a lot of the important features that we are trying to deduce um, can be easily disturbed. So for example, the image on the left is showing uh, agglutinated foraminifera and notice how close the profile camera uh, was to capturing this image. And this particular image was captured on a study where sediment grabs are being collected along with, with uh, profile images. What was occurring was that as these grabs are going down and coming up, they were finding these calcareous fragments in the grabs and it was um, confusing to the scientists on board as to what was actually uh, going on with these calcareous fragments. It was only upon the survey was complete and the analy analyzation of the profile images that it was discovered that those calcareous fragments were from these agglutinated foraminifera. What was occurring was that as the grab was going down, the bow wave from the grab was shattering these sensitive taxa, uh, these fragile taxa um, during collection. And then the image on the right is showing uh, at the top here, essentially a flocculent layer of, of algae that has deposed or deposited on the ambient seafloor located here. And note that you know this type of material is, is extremely sensitive. It can be easily washed away by any sort of like current. And note that this profile camera has collected and documented this particular feature without disturbing or wiping or knocking off that uh, fluff that exists there. So there's real power here with SPY to capture in situ conditions as they exist um, compared to you know, using a sediment grab, which might disturb the bottom. The other real power of this approach is to be able to detect disturbance gradients, um, really effective at detecting and mapping disturbance gradients as they exist. And again, this has real importance for the deep water horizon story. So in this example, the profile camera is being used to look at the effect of synthetic drilling muds on the bottom. And so uh, the little graphic at the bottom shows the relative location of the images that you're gonna see relative to the drill location. So note that this particular survey, we essentially start out away from the drill on relatively undisturbed bottom. We start moving closer, you'll notice that the bottom gets disturbed and then we'll move back away, away from the, the, the path of disturbance. So uh, starting out first, initially the image on the left, we see that there's, this is a, an ambient bottom. As you start to move closer to the image on the right, you start to see indications of drilling mud within the particular uh, sediment profile. As we get uh, closer and closer to the well, we begin to see that the drilling muds takes up more and more uh, presence within the sediment column till we're essentially sampling right along the well. And uh, we're starting to see that not only is the majority portion of the sediment column all drilling muds, for example, as in this particular image, but also due to the high organic material that's here, we're seeing the presence of uh, theophilic bacteria, which are these filamentous strands that you see uh, on the sediment surface. So this is essentially a bacteria mat on the seafloor. Then as we step back away from the well, we see that the presence of drilling muds begins to decrease again until we're back on ambient bottom again. So when looking at these images, um, in addition to documenting and being able to assess preserving situ conditions and also to be able to uh, spatially map out, we're also attempting to understand the health and the function of the mythic community. And this is really important when it comes to assessing whether or not uh, disturbance is having an ecological impact. So there's a successional model that exists for marine benthic, benthic systems that holds true for soft bottom communities around the world. And it's represented in this conceptual diagram that I'm, I'm showing on the screen. This paradigm was defined independently by two groups of scientists in the late 1970s. And so the upper panel is from Long Island Sound and is assessing the impact of dredge material over time. And the lower panel, excuse me, is from the Scottish Sea, uh, looking at a pulp mill and is assessing the impact of mill waste over distance. And so I think what's really important here is to note that in each of these particular locations, uh, the taxa, the individual taxa are different, um, but the functional role and response of those taxa within the community is the same. So the successional model describes the response of animals in the sediment to a disturbance. So if you get a disturbance that's large enough, you can denude the existing community, which will be your stage zero here on the left. And then the first, <coughs> excuse me, 
settlers and recolonizers are opportunistic species that are the marine equivalent of fast growing weeds. Um, so I think the best way, the best analogy here is to think about forest fires. You know, after a severe forest fire, you don't immediately get harmful trees, you have to undergo forest succession first. And the same thing happens in soft bottom benthic communities. At stage one, these are tiny worms that would fall through like a one millimeter sieve, often used during benthic grabs. But these worms help condition the sediment for larger worms in shallow burrows, which would be your stage two taxa. And finally, over time, you have large head down deposit feeders for burrows that are penetrating much deeper into the sediment, um, indicating that uh, there's a healthy mature benthic community that exists. And one of the evidentiary lines that we use to assess if a uh, uh, sediment community is at stage three, successional state, is through the presence of feeding voids. Whoops, <laughs> located here. Sometimes there's an animation that comes up. Uh, <laughs> these, um, the presence of these features within the sediment column suggests that the benthic community is healthy. And the organisms or taxa that produce these voids are relatively sensitive and would be some of the first to die off if an area was experiencing disturbance. So here's an example of a healthy seafloor that is experiencing or has late stage succession. And you have a deep sediment oxic layer. So that, um, again, that ARPD layer that I talked about earlier, but you can see the, the brown rust red brown color sediment extends deep within the sediment column. And you have a number of deep burning organisms. We can see animals within uh, their burrows that are up against the face plate of the prism, as well as this feeding void that's been produced uh, by this organism here. So it's important to understand the functional status of the benthos because I think probably one of the most important functions that infauna serve within a marine ecosystem uh, that is susceptible to um, a perturbation uh, any sort of perturbation, is their influence on sediment geochemical and physical properties uh, known as bioturbation. Uh, this is the biological mixing of sediments. So bioturbation by infauna is an important ecosystem function. Uh, and that varies based on you know, a number of things, sediment grain size, organic content and quality, community structure, and even season. And so I think you know, given that most pollutants that enter, that can enter estuaries or coastal waterways or even uh, deep sea um, locations, uh, tend to be particle reactive and bind the sediment particles, the level of bioturbation can play a key role, not just in distributing these pollutants throughout the biologically mixed layer, but also in helping to process them. Oh, there's an animation. All right, now to the Deepwater Horizon event. So in 2010, just before the Deepwater Horizon incident, Rex and Adder published a review about you know, essentially everything that we know up to that point within the deep sea. And one of the big paradigms or major paradigm within deep sea sediments, which was highlighted by Rex and Etter, is that in the deep sea, it's largely assumed that there is little to no macroscopic organisms below 10 centimeters. And the macrofauna that are present in the upper sediment column are small bodied. And this paradigm is largely true for deep sea oligotrophic systems. Uh, so the graphs at the top are from Rex and Edder, and they show the distribution of very sized fauna in the sediment column. This red horizontal line indicates that 10 centimeter demarcation. And if we focus on the two columns on the right, uh, representing the distribution of myo macro fauna, we can see there's little to no macroscopic organisms below 10 centimeters. And when we look at representative spy from uh, a location that is in an oligotrophic deep sea, we can see that um, there really is very little biological activity that's occurring deep within the sediment. So this is a um, sediment profile image that was captured from the Caspian Sea to provide a sense of scale. This image is 20 centimeters by 15 centimeters. And in the image, we can see that there is no biological activity at depth and the sediment and the macrofauna that are present are confined uh, to these shallow depths and are of a small body size. So because of this mindset, when you look to the literature, you find that most benthic work, regardless of the equipment used uh, for sieves or the depth to which um, sediment was collected, um, the sediment is only sieved down to 10 centimeters. And part of the reason for this is if you've ever tried to sieve consolidated clay, which is typical of subsurface deep sea sediments uh, through like a 250 mil sieve, you understand this is quite difficult and why deep sea ecologists are reluctant to sample below 10 centimeters, especially if there's nothing there. So in the spring of 2010, a disaster occurred. 
The blowout of the Makanda wellhead resulted in the loss of 11 lives and the release of approximately 5 million barrels of crude oil and natural gas into the Gulf of Mexico. And this was different from many other spills. It was not simply some tanker run aground. No, this was a blowout that occurred offshore at depth in an order of magnitude larger than anything else in American history. And the results from that spill had wide reaching implications, um, imperiling both the water column, shallow water coastal communities, and the Gulf economy. Excuse me. This is the disaster that everyone saw at the surface. The story that I'm presenting today is what happened at depth. And with respect to the deep sea floor, many of the disastrous impacts have been unintentionally over-exaggerated. So this is the plume that we all saw on the live feed. And everyone knows that this is bad, but visually it's reminiscent of another deep sea phenomenon, those black smoker chimneys at hydrothermal vents which also release toxic material, but have an unexpected positive effect enriching the surrounding oligotropic seafloor, allowing for diverse and large body life to propagate. So following the spill, what did the public care about this event? There are two primary messages that were conveyed. The first was that the recovery from the spill would be long lasting, taking decades or longer. And the second was just how extensive the damage was, both in terms of severity and in breadth, presenting the area around the wellhead as a dead zone. Now, what really hurt BP and why they had to settle for such an obscene amount of money uh, with respect to the spill wasn't just the damage, but also that they had no baseline data. So they couldn't make an assessment on injury. There was only one location with baseline data that was remotely near the Makanda well, and it occurred at a site known as Viasca Knoll, which is approximately 50 kilometers away from Wakanda. So I, so I showed some of these images earlier when we were discussing how the spy system can document disturbance gradients and the impact of drilling wells on the benthos. So Viasca Knoll was a survey that took place in 2000 and it was done to assess drilling muds on the benthos. The site was sampled in, uh, the, was it sampled in 2000 and almost a decade later it was resampled. And so this is a, PV image from that specific work. And so you can note on the bottom that there are tracks on the, on the surface and some small and large burrows. And this is again, 10 years after um, the site was initially um, sampled. And so here's a footprint of the spy camera. And here's what the center profile looks like. And so this is again, 10 years after the initial disturbance. And so in the spy, we can see the optical signature of the old drilling mud of the old uh, drilling mud, which is this central layer here, as well as the uh, historical seafloor and this more um, recent deposition that's occurred. But more importantly, whoops, more importantly, we can see that there are animals that are burrowing through this material deep down into the sediment, even as deep as the, um, through this old drilling mud layer, and even as deep as uh, the relic uh, surface, much deeper than 10 centimeters, because again, drilling muds are organic, and so there's food there for these animals to mine. So deeping, deeper burrowing than what's normally observed in a deep sea system. And what did this look like in 2000? Well, here we go. We can see that there's very little physical activity or uh, biological activity occurring in the sediment column. We can see there's a pretty deep layer of uh, drilling muds. And so what we're looking at right now is essentially impact Know, following initial drilling and then recovery approximately 10 years or a decade later. And this is be important as it relates to the deep water horizon story. All right, so what did we do? <clears throat> Our objective was to assess the seafloor surrounding the Makanda wellhead. Uh, we had a series of radial transects that were laid out surrounding the wellhead going out to 10 kilometers and included a number of far field stations to determine the extent of potential impact. This project was conducted uh, for this project, three legs were conducted, one in early 2000, one in late 2000, and then another in the spring of 2014. So as a result of all this work, we had data at more than 800 stations around the wellhead over approximately three years. And the results that I'm gonna talk about today really are related to um, analysis of data from the first two years. So that would be the spring and fall of 2011. So we're showing results essentially of the seafloor one year after the spill. So one of the first things we noticed about the seafloor around the wellhead is that the area was definitely not a dead zone as we observed numerous indications of enhanced secondary productivity. So what you're looking at right now is a surface shot from the plan view camera. And this station is located approximately one kilometer from the wellhead. And for most of these uh, example images, you'll note that in the uh, upper part of the slide, 
I'll show the relative location of the station to the center part of the well. So again, this station is approximately one kilometer from the wellhead. And in the image, we observe dense polychaete inforaminifera tubes blanketing the bottom. In addition to these small tubes, we also observe elazipodia, which are uh, these unique sea cucumbers that walk around on uh, leg-like projections foraging around on the bottom. And if we then take a look at the sediment profile image at this particular station, we found a thick oxic layer that's three to four centimeters beneath the sediment surface. And along with the deep oxic layer, we also see quite a bit of reworking in the sediment indicating in fauna activity. So again, this is an area that was supposed to be considered a dead zone you know, one year after the spill, but we're finding numerous indications of macroscopic life from both the plan view and sediment profile image. But more importantly, we're finding evidence of mature benthic communities as evidenced by the presence of feeding voids within the sediment. Again, feeding voids are the product of head down deposit feeders and their presence is an indication that there's organic enrichment allowing for the sediments to be mined. And so this is something that you would only see at heterotropic conditions. And if we move closer to the wellhead, this next station is 300 meters from the wellhead to the east. And one of the major observations at this particular location was our ability to see evidence of oil in the sediment. Oh, sorry, someone's calling my phone. <laughs> <laughs> our ability to see evidence of oil in the sediment. Um, and so you can see that oil uh, up against the faceplate of the prism as it, those droplets are transected or those globules are transected and smeared. And so again, remembering in the beginning, the deep sea paradigm about there being um, little to no macroscopic life below 10 centimeters. And this spy image, I've demarcated that 10 centimeter depth with a horizontal white line. And with this reference mark, you can see evidence of feeding voids of head down deposit feeders, again, mature benthic organisms, both above and below the 10 centimeter depth. At the surface, we're also able to observe a number of spionic worm tubes covered in fecal pellets. Be located basically right here and right there. So what's important from this representative image is not just that there's macroscopic life so close to the wellhead, but that the macroscopic life is present large body and occurring below the 10 centimeter depth. So these observations completely contradict deep sea benthic paradigm and this notion that you know, immediately following uh, the spill, the area around the wellhead was a dead zone. So we take a look at another station approximately 200 meters from the wellhead. And again, this is one year after the spill. And I should point out that there was a 200 meter exclusion zone around the wellhead because of debris. So that was the closest that we were able to sample. What we see here is a seafloor that's covered in vegetoa mats, but there is also a high density of polychaetes present. So if we zoom in, we can see a fecal mound. Oops. You can see a fecal mound located here from a head down deposit feeder, as well as numerous polychaete tubes. You can actually even see a polychaete on the sediment surface right here. When we look at the spy, again, we see evidence of animals burrowing with deep reworking that's occurring as well as the presence of those important head down deposit feeders due to the presence of feeding voids in the sediment column. Now, we also observed evidence of enrichment even farther off from the wellhead than was expected. So this station is approximately three kilometers from the wellhead. And again, I've demarcated that 10 centimeter depth in the sediment column. And in this image, you can see numerous indications of biogenic activity of head down deposit feeders from the voids they produce well below the 10 centimeter depth. And again, if we enlarge a portion of the image, you can see that these are big worms that are down at this depth feeding. So we were also able to document the results of the top kill effort. I'm not sure if you really remember those. Top kill was an effort to stop the spill by plugging it from the top. So drilling muds were pumped into the well in an effort to clog it. And the results were, as you might expect, those muds just shot right back up <laughs> and went off in a Northwest direction, creating a footprint on the seafloor. And so, if we look at a uh, PV image of this area, um, this is the area that's nearest to the wellhead uh, within that direction that the top kill effort kind of spread out. When we look at this PV image, again, this is one year after the spill, we can see that the seafloor almost looks like a lunar landscape. Most of the surface is drilling muds, but also note there are a number of tracks from animals that are foraging around through it. So this area, despite being um, um, disturbed and severely impacted by that top kill effort, there's still lots of organisms out that are, um, lots of macroscopic organisms that are, that are feeding in this material. 
And when we looked at the depth of buyer intubation, oh, and so when we look at the spy at this particular image, we can also see that not only are there animals foraging on the seafloor surface, we also have, again, indications of head down deposit feeders due to the uh, numerous voids that are present within the sediment column. So those are representative, but when we look at the depth of bioturbation at all of our stations from both legs, so this would be both the spring and fall of 2011, we found deep burrowing to be ubiquitous around the wellhead. So from the map key in the lower left, the blue color indicates the depth of bioturbation that only extends to 10 centimeters. So that would be essentially representative of that deep sea paradigm. Now take a look at this map. Do you see any blue dots on here? At every station that we sampled around the wellhead, we observed evidence in the presence of deep bioturbating organisms. This is a picture that was taken from a blog um, by a, a researcher named Samantha Joy, and she conducted a lot of work on the Gulf of Mexico seafloor following the Deepwater Horizon. And from her post, Joy was implying that this entire core was oil because of the pink color of the sediment below the surface. Now, this is a mischaracterization. And, uh, in shallow benthic systems, ferric iron is oxidized, giving sediments that rust red brown colors. That would be representative of the sediment oxic layer. But in the deep sea, manganese is what's oxidized. And when it precipitates out, it's pink. So this is essentially a mischaracterization of what was in the core. This is really just a sediment oxic layer. And this is the station where Joy collected her core where we also have a PV image from. And on the seabed, there are no visible signs of disturbance. We can see lots of tubes covering the seafloor. And in the profile, again, there is a thick sediment oxic layer that is, has this pinkish hue, which is again, common in deep sea sediments. Um, but also there are indicators of mature benthic taxa. Um, here's a feeding void from the presence of a head on the positive feeding. So again, these areas are, are what we found and observed where these areas were, were pretty healthy and rich with life. And so I think this is where the relevance of the parable of the blind men and the elephant begins to make sense as to why our results immediately following the Deepwater Horizon spill uh, within the Gulf of Mexico differ from so many others. Most of the benthic community analysis work for Deepwater Horizon was done through sediment grabs and core sampling, which I discussed earlier is sieved only to a depth of 10 centimeters. These methods are reductionist, but also offer a limited spatial scope of the seafloor. So if you overlay, which I've done here, the footprint of the two primary box cores used during the Deepwater Horizon event, and the, or sorry, two prime box cores that are just typically used to sample deep sea sediments, and the multi-core array, which was used during the Deepwater Horizon event, you can see that depending on where they land, you can miss quite a bit. And honestly, even with SPY alone, you would have a limited spatial scope. It's only to the combination of our aerial surface shots and center profile images that we're able to get an accurate assessment of what's going on in the deep, on, what's going on in these deep sea sediments. And so I think it's really important to recognize and understand that all the work that's been published using traditional sampling methods as it relates to deep water horizon is gonna be a biased underestimate of what actually exists because of the inherent flaws within the limitation, because of the inherent flaws and limitations of the methodology. And again, I think it's really important to reiterate that with respect to our results, you know, we clearly recognize that others aren't deliberately misrepresenting the work, but have a limited perception of what's going on down there due to the limitations in their sampling. So at one year after the spill, when trying to determine biological impact from the Deepwater Horizon event on the deep Gulf of Mexico, there was only one variable, variable where we could see uh, impact, and that was with the ARPD depth. And again, the ARPD depth was a representation of the, essentially the depth of the uh, sediment oxic layer within uh, the sediment. So these graphs show the ARPD depth on the y-axis <clears throat> in centimeters and the distance from the wellhead on the x-axis in kilometers. And each one of these graphs represents a different transect from our radial spire that I showed earlier. And so you can see that for each of the transects for the ARPD depth, ARPD is much shallower near the wellhead and gets deeper the further away that you get from the wellhead. And when we look at all the transects together, the inflection point for the ARPD depth moving away from the wellhead center occurs at approximately two kilometers from the wellhead. And so, oops. So what more recently was in the news with regards to Deepwater Horizon? So this was you know, five years after the spill. Um, you know, five years after the spill, it was still being reported that oil 
uh, was persisting and was scattered off far from the wellhead. And more importantly, in publications that were, uh, were still coming out, it was suggested that you know, one year after this bill, deep sea benthos were still impaired and would require quite a bit of time from, for recovery. Now, from our observations, we observed much less of a footprint. If we look at the actual area of the seafloor, one year post the spill in 2011, affected at a 95% uh, confidence interval, we found the range of effect was you know, 2.3 kilometers or roughly 3.7 square miles, much less than reported by, by, by others. And again, we're defining effect based on ecosystem service, ecosystem services that were impacted. And again, from our observations, the only uh, metric that we assessed and documented that was impacted was the depth of the uh, ARPD. So a quick little summary of the results. We found that, you know, in general, uh, which I didn't touch on too much, the center grain size is pretty uniform throughout, you know, it's a low energy depositional environment. There were opt optically distinct depositional layers from the wellhead or, or the incident response that existed. So that would be that top kill effect. Um, we didn't find or document any extensive areas of an anoxic sediment, though there were theophilic bacteria mats that extended out approximately you know, 1.3 kilometers from the wellhead. We were able to document well droplets in the sediment that were evident in the surface deposition about out to about two kilometers from the wellhead. Uh, we didn't document any azoic area. In fact, we uh, found that there was a diverse benthic community <clears throat> uh, with head down deposit feeding taxa that existed at all the samples, all the locations that we sampled throughout the, and around the wellhead. Uh, and that the enhanced area of secondary productivity uh, extended beyond the three to 500 meters and even further out to you know, one to two kilometers away from the wellhead. Uh, but more importantly, uh, we noted that this existing paradigm that seems to uh, exist within the deep sea regarding benthic community structure um, tends to be incorrect. You know, we, we found that there were just you know, more e evidentiary at every station we, we documented and assessed that there was evidence of deep burrowing fauna. And I think, again, more importantly, despite the dire predictions to the contrary, recolonization following the spill was quite rapid and followed, you know, really a pattern reported for uh, seep communities. So I think when we, when we start to assess both the results that we found following Deepwater Horizon, uh, along with what was being reported and, and why uh, some of the predictions were just so far off, I think in, in most people's mind, the big issue is that people view the deep sea like a biological desert because of its relatively uniform sediment type, the low temperature, and generally low biomass of fauna. And certainly some deserts like the Sahara are homogeneous with low rainfall. But then you have other deserts like the Sonora with the same physical conditions, but the difference being nutrient input. And when you had, add nutrients to a system, you get a different biological response. And so the phenomenon around Deepwater Horizon is the exact same that you see around uh, hydrothermal vents and cold seeps. You have a single point source of organic enrichment in an oligotrophic area that has the ability to enhance not just microbial production, but also macro production. And this hypothesis was recently backed up by work from Love et al, uh, showing that microbial hydrocarbon, hydrocarbon production occurs on scales previously unrealized in the, in the deep sea. And so when we look at aerial shots of the seafloor, that's been a long time, one and three years after the spill, you get a sense of just how rapidly recovery is taking place. So up until now, I haven't shown any of the, the results from our 2014 survey, but this is, a, this is just a, an image and a representation to give you a sense of just how rapid the recovery. <laughs> the top image is from 300 meters from the wellhead and the bottom image is from 500 meters from the wellhead. And we can see that, you know, on the seafloor one year after the spill, there's quite a bit of bed toa, um, maybe some areas of uh, pockets of reduced sediment. And then in 2014, we can see that there are really literally no indications of, of that particular um, perturbation on the seafloor. And when we look at the spy one and three years post the spill, you get a sense of just how rapid the recovery is taking place. Um, we can see the optical signature of drilling muds on the seafloor and the um, profile image one year after the spill. And then if we can, when we compare that three years later, we see that there's that signature is almost non-existent. 
And we also have in both of the images evidence of deep burrowing um, head down deposit beaters. So if you recall, two kilometers from the wall head was the area of ARPD impairment. And the ARPD data that was presented earlier was exclusively from 2011. And in this particular um, instance, we're comparing ARP data from 2011 and 2014. And so that we can see three years later, two thirds of the stations show improved ARPD depth. So even that one particular metric that we found to be, uh, um, to show uh, ecological impairment has already beginning to recover uh, in most instances by 2014. So, how long will it take to achieve full recovery? Uh, we suspect or hypothesize that history will repeat itself. If you recall the presentation of the impact of synthetic, synthetic drilling wells on the bottom from the Viasca Null site in the Gulf of Mexico, you remember that in roughly a decade, the system had recovered to ambient bottom or to ambient background conditions. So three years post the spill, we're already seeing stations that are showing signs of recovery. And I imagine that within a decade, the seafloor around the Makanda wellhead Will have been recovered. So we're, we're essentially are approaching our, our around that time. And if if we went out, someone wanted to fund us to go out and conduct a similar survey, I suspect we would find a similar path of recovery. So in conclusion, we found that there was no dead zone or azoic zone around the wellhead. Uh, there was a diverse benthic community with deposit feeding taxa that existed at all locations that were sampled. So the benthic community was not, uh, did not appear to be arrested in any way. <clears throat> Despite the higher prediction to the contrary, the recolonization um, following the initial impact was fairly rapid and appeared to follow a pattern that's been reported around seep communities. Uh, more importantly, this paradigm that exists and related to the deep sea uh, with there being little to no animals below 10 centimeters um, it is incorrect. Um, and Results from Deepwater Horizon that are published using these traditional sampling methods are almost certainly um, underestimating the mythic community that's there given the shallowness to which they are sieving and sampling the sediments. And finally, I think there's this particular study just shows the real value of taking uh, a visual view of the seafloor and getting a kind of this holistic perspective of what's occurring. So with that, I'll take any questions. Uh, four ish minutes. Great, thank you so much. That was amazing. Um, if anyone has any questions, feel free to unmute yourself um, or you can throw them in the chat as well. Are you able to see the uh, chat, Kersey? We do have one question. That can um, yeah, let me, let me, maybe I can minimize the screen. Uh, oh, they didn't make the other screen go up. Uh, I can just read it out if that's easier. Yeah, why don't you just, just yep. do that? From Ian, uh, he's wondering if you could speak to any observed compositional shifts in addition to the unexpected presence or absence, perhaps a shift to more tolerant assemblages. Yeah, that's a good question. I think what's really important to understand about the method that we utilize to sample the seafloor is that it does not assess um, specific taxa from a species perspective. So you're not going to be able to generate species lists and assess how uh, a community might shift in terms of the taxa that are present there at a species level. The profile approach is more focused at assessing functional diversity. And so we can assess, uh, you know, whether or not uh, different functional types are there by the evidentiary lines that we're um, uh, interpreting within the sediment, but not uh, a species assemblage list. Thank you. Um, Karen Wishner um, is asking if you could describe your analysis methods briefly, how you determined a single ARDP, ARPD uh, depth with all the spiky variability. Yeah, sorry, what was the last part? The something variability? Uh, with the spiky variability um, when you were trying to pick your depths. Yeah, yeah, no, that's, that's, a, good, that's a good question. And so, you know, essentially what we do is that for every image that we collect, we uh, measure the relative area of the ARPD. So if I, let me see, blow the screen up again. 
we would essentially, let's just say, you know, this is the ARPD layer here. We would essentially quantify this area, get an average depth for a particular image at each station, which I didn't point out, we collect replicate images. So we have three replicate images per station. So if there was any sort of small scale spatial heterogeneity, we would hopefully capture that. And then we get a mean for that particular uh, station location. And then we take that information and extrapolate it out for the, the number of stations that we get. So you get all that variability due to the replication that's, that's occurring from the uh, quantification. I hope that answered the question. And then for an analysis perspective, we just essentially ran, um, uh, what's it called? Paired linear regression or uh, what it's called? Something like that. Essentially a paired linear regression. Yeah, I have a question. If you can. The, um, the feeding voids that you see in the SIP images, how long will they stay around? Say that worm is gone. That and how long would that structure stay around? Yeah, that's a really good question. And I think it gets to um, an important determination where we're essentially interpreting geological features and relating them to a biological uh, relevance. And you know, the, the, the reality is that more often than not, when we're looking at these images, these feeding voids have signatures around them that indicate that they are or have recently been active. And, one of the, the signatures that's the telltale sign of, of activity is this little oxic halo that can exist around a void. And so, you know, when we're making determinations of whether or not to, to count or a, a burrow or a void for uh, being uh, an indication of uh, evidence of biological activity, we're looking for those particular signs that indicate that this is an active feature as, as opposed to a relic feature. Uh, as far as how long do they stay around, um, my observations is, is not very long, uh, you know, less than, it, it depends on the area. If you're in an area that's biologically active, not very long. If you're in an area that is, uh, say, uh, relatively anoxic you know, and, and stable, um, they could probably last for quite a bit of time. Great, thanks. Hi there, I have a question. Um, and I, thanks so much for a great talk. It was really great. Um, I did get interrupted partway through, so I apologize if you did talk about this, but what I was curious about is you saw this great recovery. Do you think that it's related to the fact that this area is an area that has a lot of active seepage already? I guess when we think about like the microbial response to the spill, I think a lot of the messaging is that, you know, this is an area that where microbes are, the, the communities there are ready to, to deal with hydrocarbons because there's natural seepage. Do you think this is relates to what you've seen too, that the recovery is because the, the metazoan communities in this area are already sort of adapted for dealing with these conditions. Yeah, absolutely. And I think what's really important to understand here is that the, um, the macroorganisms that we are focusing on here that, are, that we're utilizing as our base for recovery, they're, they're really just vessels for the microbial community. Um, so the microbes are doing all the, the, the heavy work, the heavy work here. And certainly from a e evolutionary perspective, given the fact that the Gulf of Mexico is an active seep zone and location, you have this microbial community that has evolved over time to uh, be able to process these hydrocarbons. A lot of the really toxic aromatics that were in the crude oil, a lot of that got burned off before it even settled to the bottom. So a lot of the uh, hydrocarbons that were settling on the bottom had the aromatics already burned out of them by the water column microbes. And then the gut microbes that are in the, that are associated with these polychaete organisms, um, you know, they're essentially just eating food at that point because a lot of the really toxic stuff had already been processed. So short answer, yes, this is certainly I believe the results that we're seeing here are representative of a unique system where the, certainly at least the macro or organisms within the sediment and the microbial community have evolved to be able to handle this huge influx. Uh, would you expect to see this same replication in other systems? It's hard to say. I, I would suspect maybe not. Great, thanks. I would suspect maybe not, but we do also have, and this is a, uh, one of the, 
this, do I have, uh, let me see if I put this, I meant to throw this on. Oh, you know, I don't think I did. Oh, well, this will be a good representation. I, I suspect maybe not, but we, this is part of one of the papers we're working on. We've started to dig in a little more into this phenomenon of deep sea bioturbators around um, areas that have been anthropogenically enriched. And so obviously we have the Gulf of Mexico location here, which is the deep um, from deep water horizon. And going back to some of the other uh, work that we've done, we're, what we're finding is that this instance of there being essentially a influx of a large quantity of organic material into the deep sea over a relatively short time period does seem to be stimulating these bioturbative activities that we see in the deep sea. So this particular example here is from is off the coast of California, and it's from dredge material that's being deposited in the deep sea. And you can see again, uh, this is in an area where there's the dredge material. There's just chock full of uh, these um, uh, these feeding voids. And when we compare that, which I don't have an example to show, when we compare that to areas outside of that dredge material zone, you, you tend to see a, a deep sea flood. It looks more like what we're this particular representative example. This is that Viasco Knoll site. Uh, we went back and looked at a lot of those images. And again, we were, we were finding that even in these areas where there was this high level of disturbance from the synthetic drilling muds on the bottom, we were still seeing uh, deep burrows, uh, deep head down deposit feeding organisms. And then this particular location is in the Ivorian Basin. And it's again around um, a drilling rig and drilling muds. And again, we were finding evidence again of deep head down deposit feeding organisms. So I. I I, my, I think my initial impression was that this particular phenomenon that we were observing in the Gulf of Mexico was a unique Gulf of Mexico specific uh, response, but I don't, I don't think that's the case. I think that the larger deep sea um, has the ability and capacity when there is this uh, large organic material that's deposited over a relatively short amount of time to respond to it in a way that I think was previously unrealized. And I had another really good, oh no, I don't have it. We have another really good, um, we have the organic, a lot of these locations have uh, associated organic content, sediment organic content uh, data with them. And when we correlated the two with bioturbation depth, the trend is actually quite strong. I can't believe I forgot to put that slide up here. That's a really good question though. We did have one other question in the chat from um, Andrew Davies. Um, his question is, what was the impact of the SPI camera on the seafloor in terms of footprint? Mm. That is a good question. And the impact is minimal. I usually, I usually have a slide that shows, oh, I don't have it on here, that shows uh, the footprint of the, um, excuse me, of the profile camera after it's basically been pulled up, the plan view camera, plan view camera accidentally triggers and you get a, a sense of what the footprint is. And it's, it's very minimal. You, get, you have a slight impression from the base frame. And then, you know, you, if, you, if you've ever seen what a sediment grab looks like after it's pulled up this grab and like the whole C4 is just like disturbed and there's reduced uh, sediment all over the place, it's nothing like that. It's really just like this imprint on the bottom of where this thing has landed as the prism pulls back out and the sediment kind of fills back in and uh, the only indication really that the system was there was due to the, the imprint from the, the base frame. But when we're collecting the sediment, you know, there is a, you know, it's minimally invasive and, uh, and, I, and we use that term minimally because you'll, you'll notice that all of the profile images have this streaking associated with them. So when we're doing these interpretations, we're having to factor in and account for the fact that, you know, this, where this actual dredge, um, dredge material, excuse me, where this uh, drilling mud is, is extended in the actual, uh, in the actual profile image isn't, isn't accurate. You know, this is a, an artifact of the, the drag down that exists. So we have to counter, counter for that as part of our measurements. And it's the same thing with the, the depth of the sediment oxy layer. You know, this is an artificial depth that is due to some of the drag down. Um, Jeremy is wondering if drilling muds contain toxins that wouldn't be present in crude oil. Um, to my knowledge, no. Uh, part of, you know, there's a, there's a pretty extensive EIS that goes on with uh, the drilling fluids and, and in their ability to 
be able to release them onto the bottom. They have to show in a lot of locations and areas that they're relatively, um, I don't want to say benign, but they, that they have, they're not going to essentially denude the bottom of, of organisms. Uh, if that was the case, they would require them to essentially collect them and haul them back to shore, which is extremely expensive. And so as a result, a lot of these companies and organizations, they have a, a vested interest in ensuring that the material is as um, minimally damaging as possible. Hey, Kersey, question here. Um, oh, hey, Giancarlo. Oh, hi, Kersey. <laughs> I didn't think you could recognize me by my voice, but maybe my name popped up. Anyways, um, good to hear from you. And um, I didn't see hardly any um, evidence of anoxia or hypoxia down there. Presumably, you know, it's cold. Um, and the veggie toe that were there, um, which, you know, in, in shallow waters usually do indicate uh, severe hypoxia, are, are they there just because of the high organic uh, matter? Do you, do you find any evidence of like low oxygen with very high organic matter in the deep sea? Yeah, you know, that's a really good point. I think that they're certainly being driven by the organic matter. And an important thing to, to note uh, for those uh, on the call, you know, Vegetoa like to exist at, at this medium between uh, anoxia and, um, I want to say, and hypoxia, almost like a severe hypoxia. You know, they, they can't really tolerate a complete absence of oxygen and they can't really tolerate uh, really high levels of oxygen. So they're, they're, they're almost always kind of like adjusting uh, their, their presence or uh, within the sediment column relative to that particular boundary. And they really kind of explode when that boundary overlaps with uh, organic material, uh, reduced organic material in this particular case, hydrogen sulfide. So I, I think that the presence of their, uh, the, these organisms at this particular location um, is really driven by the organic material that's there. And I, I have no doubt that the because of the high organic material and the increased metabolic uh, response that's occurring due to the processing of that material at a microbial level, that you are having a reduction of bottom water uh, oxygen levels. I suspect that it's while it's being reduced, it's not being reduced to the extent that it's creating any sort of like uh, localized hypoxic zone, um, especially because in a lot of these areas, we still see large macroscopic organisms. And I think, you know, one of the things, I know you know this, Giancarlo, that at the benthic boundary layer, the rate of oxygen uh, reduction can occur quite rapidly over very minuscule, um, uh, minuscule scales. So you can, you know, essentially go from this location here having you know, almost six to seven milligrams of oxygen to down to the surface and be at, you know, one to one milligram of oxygen. So like that, I, what I suspect is happening is that in a very small frame of area, because of the high organic material, you are getting a reduction of um, bottom water hypoxia, but it, it's so minuscule as to not have a larger impact on what we're seeing over the bottom. Because again, we see so many uh, large mobile organisms that coincide in these areas due to their organic material. So to follow up, this is an area of very low energy and like a micro layer of low oxygen could occur. Yes. Thank you, Gersey. It's a great answer. Thanks. <laughs> um, Catalina Martinez is asking if you could tell us about your new nonprofit to make the deep sea more accessible and your engagement work around that effort. Oh yeah, sure, certainly. Um, so you're, she's referring to oceanography for everyone. This was a venture that I started with a colleague at Duke and it was born out of a frustration for, uh, due to the expensive nature of oceanographic equipment. And when these pieces of equipment breaking and being expensive to repair and be truthfully honest, we were drunkenly sitting around one night uh, talking about how we could built something that was equally as accurate for thousands of dollars less. And the next morning when we sobered up, we did a little proof of concept, run, making a run to Radio Shack, and we, we developed the first uh, proof of concept for this device we called OpenCTD. And we used that to crowdsource uh, money to essentially try to make that tool 
scientifically accurate. And our initial goal was to develop a CTD that could sample to a depth of 200 meters, you know, roughly the continental shelf that you could put together for uh, tools that are roughly, um, roughly around the cost of $100. Recognizing that a lot of the um, big effort and expense is the proprietary information about how to calibrate the, the equipment so that you were able to get the accurate measurements. And so it was certainly a journey um, over a number of years that, that we worked on this particular device. Over that time, we really kind of found through engagement that there was a community of people that were really interested in the idea of developing open source tools that developed into open source oceanography and the development of a few other open source uh, hardware tools. And the end result was that, at least for this particular project that catalyzed it all, OpenCTD, we managed to get the device to being approximately 2% accurate, accurate of um, a more expensive uh, CTD or your standard commercial CTDs and down to a depth of 200 meters and for the low, low cost of $300. And so we, as was our intention with all the tools, um, have all the build instructions and the software and, and even instructions on how to like just learn how to do basic things like soldering and that kind of thing on our, our particular website using GitHub and the open source community. And our, our goal was to try and empower researchers, um, both researchers who might necessarily might not necessarily have the funding to buy a $5,000 or $25,000 piece of equipment, <clears throat> as well as researchers who might be in locations in areas where some of these tools are just inaccessible. And with the idea being like, oh, if it breaks, it's so cheap, you just throw it away and just build a new, build a new one. Um, so yeah, that's oceanography for everyone. Um, feel free to check it out and provide feedback. Great, thank you so much, Kersey. Um, that, was, that was really, really wonderful. Um, just a reminder to students and postdocs that you're free to stay on the call um, if you want to chat further. And thank you everyone so much for coming and being so engaging today. Thanks all. Thanks, Kersey.